Welcome to the latest episode of Here's What We Know, the podcast of unexpected conversations. Before I get started, I want to thank my sponsors, encourage you to explore their businesses because they make this possible. Now, let me introduce you to my guest. And I totally admit I'm a history nerd and more so a presidential history nerd. And this guy is an expert. Luke A. Nichter is a professor of history, James H. Cavanaugh Endowed Chair in Presidential Studies at Chapman University. He's the author of The Last Brahmin, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. in the Making of the Cold War, and also the author of this book, The Year That Broke Politics. Hello, Professor. Hey, hey I'm, I'm glad to be with you and to nerd out with you for a little bit. <laughs> Oh, uh, listen, you say that now, but by the end, you'll be like, oh, just <laughs> shut up. Just shut up. I I love this. As I said, I, I love the fact that you you sit back and, and kind of say, listen, we all think politics is divisive now, right? And and boy, what a hard time we're going through. But those of us, and again, I was a young child in 1968, but I was close enough to it to remember the maelstrom right? And 1968 was such a horrific year in the year of this country and in, in what's going on in this country that we've forgotten about it. Because of course, we all believe we live in the most important times, but 1968 truly was a year. Well, it, it was. I mean, uh, both at home uh, and around the world, it's one of these, sh it's shorthand for a year of revolution. I mean, it's up there with 1789 and 1848. And, you know, I mean, there's all these people who kind of study cultural and seismic changes. It, it's right up there. I mean, at home, I think uh, on the right, on the left, people didn't seem to have the answers, the way forward in terms of politics. You had the younger generation pitted against the older generation. You had unrest on our campuses due to the draft and the Vietnam War. You had a half million troops stationed in Southeast Asia. But, you know, Americans, we often put ourselves, we think we're the middle of the world and there's nothing else going on that's nearly as important. But these same sort of revolutionary trends were going on. China, you had the Cultural Revolution. Uh, you had student movement across Europe. You had apartheid in South Africa. Uh, you know, you had uh, you had the Czech invasion, the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. I mean, you had kind of you know elements and themes and ripples of revolution really all around the globe. Uh, and, and of course, you know, the, the United what the United States was going through was certainly not unique. Well, and then you add into really it was the first generation that was influenced by being able to see world events. Right. I mean, we didn't see Lincoln get killed. We didn't see Garfield get shot. We didn't see McKinley get assassinated. But we saw John F. Kennedy get killed. Right. And and coming out of that maelstrom, we never saw a war. We didn't really see the World War Two footage until well after the war. Right. And so all of a sudden you had Walter Cronkite on going, this is what happened today in Vietnam. And 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 we saw the unrest. You didn't see the 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 political conventions and how almost violent. I mean, the, the the very least we could say is chaotic, right? But we but Americans finally got to see it. The world got to see it. But America, because we were so technology driven before anybody else. Right. We have more TVs. We had everything else before anybody else in the country and the world could see what was going on. Well, no, you're right. And people reacted to events that year as they unfolded and they witnessed them from their living rooms. Uh, and, and whether it be the, the convention in Chicago uh, and the chaos in the streets outside the Democratic convention in which Mayor Daley's police participated, you know, in the chaos and the violence or whether it be the assassinations that year of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and Senator Robert Kennedy, whether it be, as you alluded to, uh, Walter Cronkite's reporting earlier that year in response to the Tet Offensive, this kind of simultaneous, seemingly spontaneous attack against uh, American and allied forces in Vietnam, which wasn't supposed to happen because we were being told the war was going better at that moment. And how could the war be going better if the enemy were capable of such a coordinated attack? So Americans reacted to events as they unfolded and and much of that reaction was w occurred in, in their living room as they w they watched these events on on their televisions. I don't think anybody under and I'll use the I'll use the age fifty right. I don't think anybody under the age of fifty truly understands 
the Vietnam War and what was going on. To me, it's not comparable to Iraq. It's not comparable to Iran, right? It, and and it, 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 was, it was something, the draft was still in effect. So you had people going against their will in some, in some cases. Nobody, there were very few who said, hey, send me to Vietnam. It, it's not like, it wasn't like after 9-11 where you had people lining up to volunteer. And even after World War II, people were lining up to volunteer. This was, this was such a divisive work because honestly, most people didn't understand what we were doing and what the objectives were, which kind of really led to the, to the failure of the entire event. What do you think? I, you know, I think you're making a really in- important, almost profound point because, you know, I spend a lot of time with 18 to 20 year olds in college classrooms. And, and you, th- you know, think about that. I mean, young people especially will surprise you by what they know, but also what they don't know. And sometimes they know things very differently than you and I would. And for them, I mean, they haven't lived a year of their lives that there hasn't been some distant war that we've been involved in. And I don't know which is really better, the divisiveness of the Vietnam era, where more people felt like they had a stake in it. And, and you could voice your opinion uh, and you could protest and it made a difference. Or now where wars are small, we don't have a draft. Uh, fewer people are involved in military service. And we have wars that are kind of like a dull pain in the background, like on the back burner, that are almost always going on that we're involved in some way, perhaps through military contractors. Uh, and we don't sense it that way. So our sense of our protest, our, our need to have oversight of public officials isn't as great as it was, you know, during the Vietnam era. And frankly, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, wouldn't choose either one, but I'm not sure which is a better scenario for democracy. I, I have always felt, because I'm a presidential history, history, history buff, right? I'm not an expert, but I find it fascinating. And I've always thought one of the most interesting stories in our country's presidential lineup has always been Lyndon Baines Johnson. I I just think, I, I think we've forgotten him. I think we forgot who he was, what he was, the scenario he came into the office with. Uh, and, and if anybody knows anything about him, I'm, I'm shocked by how few people know the, the least bit about him. Yet, I don't know if there's anybody and you, you're you much better uh, uh, opinion of this than mine. Uh, I don't know if there's been a president in the last 30, 40 years who's had the impact or was more of a linchpin to history than him. Look, I, I think just kind of by definition, to reach the office of the presidency, you've got to be an interesting person. You know, you've got to know a lot of people. You've got to work hard or at least have people around you who are working hard who are making it look like you're doing the work. And I think in the case of Lyndon Johnson, uh, you know, look, I, I grew up, I'm kind of a blue collar, lower middle class kid from Northwest Ohio, kind of uh, the, the former Rust Belt or outside of Toledo, Ohio. Uh, Texas, growing up for me, was as familiar as Mars. But that's where I went, you know, for a job, you know, after grad school. I went, you know, you're going to be a historian, you got to go where the job is. And Texas was growing and Ohio wasn't at that time. And we moved and, and lived um, about 13 years in kind of the periphery of LBJ country, just kind of outside of Austin. And, you know, a, a lot of people, I grew up in college classes and in books you read, how, how could you possibly like LBJ? He's crude, he's rude, he's raunchy at times. And, you know, I, I say this a little bit with a twinkle in my eye, that's kind of why I like him. You know, there's, you know, there, there's an authenticity to LBJ. You know, I don't care what your politics are. When a politician opens their mouth, I think it's so rare that we actually hear what they really think. You know, even in retirement, I feel like we never hear what do they, what do they really think? What really motivates them? I think with LBJ, you know, there's, there's a degree of authenticity. He often says what he really thinks. And I think that's refreshing, especially these days. Uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why that era deserves a fresh look. I love the way in your book that you talk to a lot of the people who are there, the ones that are still alive, right? And as you said, uh, I, I saw one of your interviews where you talked about how history gets repeated and nobody does the research. They just keep repeating the same stories. And you found, 
just a treasure trove of things. People, things that people actually said, you know, that I've never been, I never heard the Avril Harriman quote, and you'll have to look up Avril Harriman, you know, but I mean, he actively wanted, you know, his, his was all politics for him. He, he wanted Nixon to lose. That, and anything he had to do was about Nixon losing. It didn't matter what happened to the rest. He didn't care about the Vietnam War. And this is my take. He didn't take any, care anything about other than we have to get a Democrat elected. And to me, that was the, for as far as I've studied, that's the first huge time where even though George Washington said, beware the political par parties, it was really the first time to me that truly it was our side against their side, and we don't care what happens as long as our side wins, that we see today. Well, and if you're like me, you know, when I see a new political book, you know, on a shelf and I reach for it, you know, there's that little voice in my head that usually says, well, what's the author's take? Do they have an agenda? Do they have a favorite? And I think most people who've read this book will come away and see that, you know, I, I really do have a great deal of empathy for all four sides. I mean, I really try to present them in a way that they would recognize because all four of those families, Johnson, Humphrey, Nixon, and Wallace, helped me, about 85 of the former staffers. And I, I really don't try to make moral judgments. Um, I, I, you know, I think we've lost so much historical empathy in, about history because we're such in a rush to judge historical figures by our own standards, that we've lost a connection with history and, and really what history is. And so in the case of Avril Harriman, you know, that's an example that, you know, 50 years is, while well, everybody usually forgets 50 years later about a subject, I think 50 years, especially dealing with complex, controversial subjects, certainly like 1968, it's really just enough time to take a fresh look. People are gone, records are opened up, personal records, diaries, correspondence, and where, you know, you have, you know, really motivations, personal, partisan, political sometimes are laid bare. And now we can really look back and try to figure out what was really going on behind the scenes. I, I find this because when I read your book, and, and I've always taken this, I, I see LBJ, I see George Wallace, I see uh, Humphrey to some extent, Nixon for certain had a disdain for the elites. Yeah. They, they weren't a part of the in crowd, you know? And, and it, was, it, it, was in the, it was in the vein of Andrew Jackson, you know, if, if you can draw a line to that, right? Where it was, it was going from that. And it was, it was fascinating because everything was out there. You know, these, these men were out there and, and it's one of the things you said, if it wasn't for being on different sides, that Nixon and Johnson probably would have been fast friends because they they understood each other's background. Yeah, you know, this is something I remember, um, I think it was Lucy Baines Johnson who really went into the detail about this. She said, you know, you look at the, on the surface, they're very different. Uh, California, Texas, they look different, they spoke differently. Uh, different political parties, different politics, different approaches to governing and, 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 and being president. But she's like, look beneath the surface. If you look a little deeper, you know, didn't go to prep school, you know, were resented by those who did, didn't go to elites, elite colleges, Nixon to Whittier, Johnson to Southwest Texas, which is now Texas State, looked down upon by the national media, elites and their parties, uh, elites, you know, on the coasts. And, you know, they always faced each other on the ballot. So they were always, you know, antagonistic toward each other. 68 is the first year in their political careers where they weren't on the ballot against each other. And I think that's one of the big surprises to me. I wish I could tell you I was so brilliant to have anticipated this, that uh, the more that I talked to people and the more that I dug into archives, I realized how much they were, while they were saying things differently, I think they were really on the same side, or at least more so than not. And that was a big surprise to me. Well, and, you know, as, as you said, it's, it's understanding each other. Because I think, I think we look at California and Texas today as very different. But I think in the 1960s, especially when you get into the heart of California, I'm in California, right? And I'm in the heart of Silicon Valley. But you drive literally 25 minutes from here. 
and you get into rural things, uh, you would be shocked by uh, by the amount of, and again, this is not a political endorsement, please don't take it that way, but you would be shocked by how many Trump for presidents, Trump signs, Trump everywhere, just and that's throughout the state, not in the population centers, but throughout the state, right? And that tends to be a little bit more of, I think they have a lot more in common. It wasn't as crazy as far as the differences now. And that's where we are with population centers. It's We've had that whole thing about the electoral college. You know, let's get rid of the electoral college. Well, it's because your side lost, usually. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's know. a good point. During the Lodge, the Lodge book, which is uh, not, we're not talking about that today, it, Henry Cabot Lodge was really the last one to, to try to uh, topple the electoral college. And that was because Republicans at that time wanted to get rid of FDR or the chance there ever could be another FDR. So you're exactly right. These these things in politics, while presented nobly, you know, are, are often, you know, driven by partisan concerns. Do you think through your research, and that's where your brilliance is at, not that we're calling you brilliant, even though I think you are, uh, is is, is uh, the uh, the here, well, I kind of lost my train of thought here a second. But the the do you think that do you honestly think that Kennedy would have gotten us out of Vietnam? I mean, based on your research. Uh, Senator Kennedy. Yeah. Well, no, President Kennedy. Yeah. I'm talking about President oh, Kennedy because he's the one who, you know, led forward. And that's always been the debate. If Kennedy would have lived, right. Vietnam wouldn't have happened. You know? I, it's, would a, it's a, it's a, it's a fact. Look, historians, we're not supposed to care about counterfactuals, you know, or, or concern ourselves at all with what ifs. But it's a fascinating what if, you know, and we could talk about this for a long time. I think where I come down is, you know, so many people have talked about, they pose, the, they pose the question just as you put it, you know, what would have happened in Vietnam, you know, had Kennedy lived? And, you know, whole books have been written about this, speculative, you know, hypotheses. Uh, the reality is, you know, I once had a grad student ask me about this a few years ago, and I said, you know, I don't think anyone's actually looked at, at the 1963 Kennedy tapes in the fall because he tapes in the Oval Office almost until he's assassinated in November of 63. And why don't you go look at, forget speculating what he would have done, why don't you look at what he says he's going to do coming up? Uh, and today, these tapes are still largely un untranscribed, except for by the student. And, and, and actually, I, I, what I come away with is often in history, you have two sides, and I tend to come down somewhere in the middle. So, you know, would he have kept us out? Would he have gotten us in? I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, you can't look out beyond about 64. I think Kennedy saw Vietnam in 63, his final year of life. He was worried that it could become a campaign issue in 1964 for his reelection and one that wasn't going to help him. And what the tapes show, this is these are his own words. It's, it's as, close, as close as I can remember it, that Truman was blamed for losing China I don't want to be blamed for losing Vietnam to communism just at the time that I'm going to the American people to ask for another term. And so I think he hoped to have the Vietnam issue out of the way. So I think he was going to freeze the clock on Vietnam. We weren't going to get in deeper. We weren't going to get out for a year. And then after the 64 election, he was going to get reelected. I don't think he would have done a big buildup the way LBJ but I also don't have a noble view that he would have kept us out. I think he would have found a cautious middle path, but his primary purpose when talking about Vietnam was not Vietnam. It was getting reelected in 1964 and doing what it, what it would have taken. Do you think he could have resisted the fabled military industrial complex? Uh, because it, there's always, there's been that theory that's out that LBJ just went along to get along because he was the master politician. He understood how that goes. Do you think he would have stood up to them? Again, this is my opinion, more than LBJ did. Yeah, I, that's, that's another really great question. I mean, oh, Kennedy had more interest in foreign policy than LBJ. I think if Kennedy and Eisenhower before him and Truman before him didn't begin to commit American policy in that part of the world, you know, LBJ, who was a master of domestic policy, but with his less than sure footing in foreign policy, as I say in the book, I don't think he would have gone in search of adventure in Southeast Asia because he didn't know it very well. Uh, so I, I, Kennedy often was, I would say, was he liberal? Was he conservative? He was cautious. 
And I think he would have found a middle way. I think he would have found a way to make Vietnam look like an American victory, not a communist victory. He was very sensitive to being blamed as he brought these elites and Harvard into the White House during his presidency for being too le- too much on the left, to being weak to communism. And I think what Kennedy would have done, regardless of the number of troops stationed in Vietnam, is he would have found a way to not make his presidency look weak in the face of communism. I am fascinated by the little bon mot you threw out there just a second ago about how his tapes are not transcribed yet. Uh, t- so, you know, when Nixon's tapes came out, we, you know, the, you look, you can look back at the reporting, you know, all, the headline is basically only someone as paranoid as Richard Nixon would have bugged himself and others. Well, now we know very differently that FDR is the one that started taping in 1940, and it goes almost continuously until 1973. I would guess today on the public record, go to Google, go to YouTube, go to wherever, I would guess maybe 5% of transcripts of these tapes, about, about I'd say 5,000 hours of recordings, maybe 4,000 hours of those are transcribable, meaning the, qual- the, co- the quality, audio quality is good enough to actually hear them. They're not just blank space on the tapes. Uh, a very small percentage. Privately, I probably transcribed 15 or 20%, I'm guessing, because it's part of kind of my ongoing research. I'm hoping by the time I retire, I can kind of just give these all to the American people and put them on a website and make them searchable. Because, you know, they belong to you. They belong to Uh me, every other taxpayer and kind of stakeholder in our democratic system. And it's a shame they're not better available because these really are that fly-on-the-wall perspective of the in the Oval Office. I mean, these really are the best guide to the modern presidency and existed, and they're largely not available. It seems like a perfect job for AI. It seems like it's what it should be available now that we should have something that's not going to get bored or has to pick up the kids from school or go to, you know, my wife's work party. And just set it on, on, on auto and go figure this out. Uh, what you are proposing, and of course, you, being located where you are, it makes sense that you would propose yeah. this. You know, I've done preliminary tests uh, with, with two different major corporations that will be very recognizable using machine learning to automate transcription of tapes. And I will say we're getting close. Uh, I, you know, I don't have a commitment yet you know, to, to go all the way, uh, but that's the direction I think this has to go because the hardest part of transcription is the first draft. Uh, I've already lost some degree of hearing in my right ear you know, for doing this for 20 years. I mean, there's a sacrifice to doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and AI, we're, we're at a point now where the AI, the quality is so poor of some of these you can get maybe 50% accuracy on a first draft, uh, and that's really the threshold you need to save a lot of human time to transcribe them. And with machine learning, when you when you train the machine to understand Kennedy's manner of speech or Johnson's, because you need different trained models on each of these presidencies because the vocabulary is different, the manner of speaking is different, uh, their topics, their acronyms, the names of foreign leaders that come up are different, and AI is not very good at all that stuff. Uh, you can get to about, I've gotten to about 85% accuracy once you can train the model and if the quality is reasonably good. But what you're proposing, I think that's exactly the direction it needs to go. Uh, I'm just waiting for the right partner to come along. Okay, another thing. I told you I'd nerd out. I told you I'd just (laughs) nerd out with you so hard uh, because this is the kind of stuff I live for. Um, did, Did Johnson think you were supposed to treat your vice president like crap because he felt like Kennedy felt treated him like crap. And I mean, he wasn't wrong, right? Well, you know, no president will admit that. Uh, but those who also served as vice president, all, all were treated that way. Uh, you know, Nixon treated Agnew a certain way. Uh, you know, so much has been written about the Eisenhower-Nixon relationship how terrible, how awkward it was. I I don't really buy into that. I think that's a lot of hyperbole. If you're Eisenhower and you're a five-star general, we we don't have very many of those. Uh, Mm -hmm. You don't really need politicians. And you treat politicians a bit like sort of junior officers in the U.S. Army. And I think that's how Eisenhower treated Nixon, not any better or worse than anybody else. And I think that's the way Johnson felt he was treated by the Kennedys. I think he felt, especially by Robert Kennedy, he was never wanted to be on the ticket with his brother. 
but it was a political marriage. They really needed that to hold down that southern part of the Democratic coalition back then. And I think, you know, Johnson passed on a fair amount of that treatment to Huber, to poor Hubert Humphrey, uh, the years 1965 to early 1969. I think he, I think he upped the ante, <laughs> if you want to know the truth about it. And, and we can get into that, too, because some of the stuff that you have in the book, and, and Humphrey knew, Humphrey was so degraded and pissed off, for lack of a better term term, you know, for those of us who remember Hubert H. Humphrey, he just came across as this very nice, sweet man. But privately, you know, he would have a three fingers of scotch and get so angry. Well, I think, you know? I think and, back then, too, um, you know, you look at phases of our country's history. You know, early on in the Republic, the best path to becoming president was to be secretary of state, perhaps. And then there's a phase where maybe becoming a senator is the way to become the president. You know, there's a joke made that in the Senate, we have 100 would-be presidents at all times. Uh, and then there's a period that it's governor of a state, especially a large, industrial, important state with a big population. By Humphrey's time, you know, the way to become president is vice president, whether you're Truman, whether you're, you know, later Nixon, whether you're Johnson. And so I think Humphrey put up with that treatment perhaps a little more than, than a politician would today, because it's no automatic today that as vice president, you'll become a president. So I think Humphrey, Humphrey always believed the only reason why I've gotten th as far as I have in politics is because of that man. Sometimes he wouldn't even say his name. And so I think he felt it was a duty to, to put up with it, because while he hurts me every day, he's also helped me more than anyone else. Your Honor, I'd like to ask the the uh, to, to the, the the witness to give a supposition on this premise. Do you think there's coming, and I think it's coming soon, where the vice president at some point in an election, once they get elected, I think they're going to become the tweet monster. You think mm. you think Trump's the tweet monster? You you see this coming, right? I mean, I see it coming. Do you see it coming? I mean, and even though you serve at the whim, if you create enough disturbance and become somebody that you're known, I can't tell you who Millard Fillmore's vice president was. I can't tell you who all the vice presidents were for. It wasn't just Truman for, for FDR. He had a number of them, you know? Uh, somebody who becomes the media personality and jumps out of the... It's going to be an interesting thing. Well, and of course, the, the duties of any vice president are so dependent on the relationship that president, that vice president has with their president and the personalities involved. And they really vary. When you go back in time, the, you know, in terms of Johnson really specialized in space, because, of course, John F. Kennedy had the famous moonshot speech, where he called we would land on the moon by the end of the decade. And so you look at each vice president, and it really is different. I was surprised when I talked to Walter Mondale for this book. And of course, this is about 68 when he, you know, pretend he was never vice president, pretend he was never the Democratic nominee in 1984, uh, but he was Senator Mondale in 68. But he alluded to a later period when he was vice president with Carter during our conversations, not in the book, because it wasn't about 1968, when he described almost like working out an MOU with Jimmy Carter. And I feel like that's what vice presidents become. Because constitutionally, all you have is opening the Senate session. You might be casting a tie break breaking vote at times. You might be a heartbeat away from the presidency, as is often uh, said. But in terms of your actual day-to-day -day duties, that's about it. Vice presidents even recently haven't even had an office in the executive office building, let alone the West Wing, the traditional offices in the Senate side of the Capitol. So I think it's become a bit like, what can you get away with? What can you negotiate? What kind of MOU can you get with your president? And so the duties really vary from vice president to vice president. But I think you're right. The first time we get a really savvy, you know, social media vice president, uh, that might be a duty. We're going to see that sooner rather than later. And as much as everybody on both sides of the aisle wanted to see the noise level turn down with Trump's tweets, I think actually that's probably going to become more common in the future. Presidents have always desired to bypass the media, whether it's print, whether it's radio, whether it's television, and speak directly to the American people. And whether you like what Trump was saying or not, I think that's primarily what he was trying to do, too. Can you imagine 
if Vivek Ramaswamy, as we take this, was Trump's nominee Ooh. for vice president. Can you imagine? Because there's no way either one of them is shutting up the other. No, that would that would be an example of not turning the noise level down. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we're going to take a quick break because I want to come back and I want to talk about I want to talk about something that we just have we have just accepted. And when you think about it, it's mind blowing. And it's Robert F. Kennedy. We're coming right back with more with Luke A. Nick there on Here's What We Know. It's time to think differently when it comes to your parties, meetings, and groups. The catering from Havana Cuba Restaurant in downtown San Jose. Instead of the same old, same old, how about the most delicious Cuban sandwich you've ever had? You're tired of fries? Plantains, my friends, they'll change your world. And here's something you didn't know. Havana Cuba was voted one of the top 10 tamales in the entire South Bay. They have vegan, vegetarian, and gluten-free options, and their website is 998cuba.com. They're located at 387 South 1st Street, in downtown San Jose. It's Havana, Cuba. Let's talk relationships. Scary, huh? My friend Stephanie Flood can help. She's offering a video series that'll help you reconnect. You can do it by yourself or together. Shows a kinder and gentler way of interacting with your partner, and that can lead to them responding the same way. And Steph is offering a 100% money-back guarantee if you follow the steps and it doesn't improve the lines of communication. That's not all. Go to afloodoflove.com today. Enter the promo code Gary to get a 20% discount off the video series. It's afloodoflove.com. So here's my, here's my thing. The idea that the president would name his brother the attorney general is, again, we have just accepted it. Can you imagine today? Can you imagine if uh, only I'm using this name simply because it's a name we all know. If Joe Biden had nominated Hunter to be whatever, Secretary of State, Secretary of Commerce, can you imagine what, what would happen today? Or if Trump would have nominated, again, he had his son-in-law be, I'm not sure what he did, but if he had nominated one of his sons to be, or Ivanka, to be Secretary of the Treasury, can you imagine what would have happened? Well, I think all presidents to a degree engage in nepotism, because when you come to that foreign city of Washington, D.C., you, you want to make sure you've got friends around you. So, I mean, I think there's always been a degree of nepotism as long as there's been politics. The two have always gone back together. But I think, you know, LBJ, you know, to go back to him, was under constant criticism for uh, allowing Abe Fortas to remain a political advisor while he was an associate justice on the Supreme Court which today also add that to your list. How in the world yeah. does he continue to have hundreds of conversations with LBJ advising him on political matters while he's sitting on the Supreme Court? Well, look at LBJ, and that's judging, judging history by our standards today. Of course we wouldn't allow that today. But back then, I think, you know, not to defend LBJ, but I mean, his thought process was, isn't this better than appointing your brother to, to be attorney general? Well, I, I guess by a degree, it might Touché. be. <laughs> so I think this always existed. As long the, the question is, you know, by the time, you know, I think we're always looking to refine our democratic process. It's imperfect by definition. Uh, and I think that, you know, each, each administration we have, I think our hope, regardless of how we vote, is that we have less of this, you know, in the future. Well, people forget how we chose presidents and vice presidents in the beginning of the country. And, and right? Senate, it was and the Senate. guy who came in second. Who, the guy who came in second. So your biggest rival was your vice president. You know, uh, ask Thomas Jefferson and John Adams how that works. Well, that's what I was, I mean, people always say, and I think it's a good question. You look at the state of our government and, and it is the division, the degree of division that we have healthy? I don't know. That's a good question. I think it can go beyond a certain point where it becomes unhealthy. But to your point, I think the founders intended, they baked a certain amount of division and divisiveness into the system of government. And there's no better example than the fact that the loser becomes vice president or the fact that the states are nominating senators to Washington who might not know where the bathroom is in Washington and bring very different interests and have no idea how government's supposed to run in Washington. So I think government was established to be, I would call it kind of, uh, you know, semi-functional at all times. It was a way of keeping the federal government from becoming too powerful and, and sort of institutionally building in checks and balances in its structure. Is, is that Would that be a better system if we not 
made the Senate by direct election? I don't know. And our democracy goes through phases. Sometimes we decide we go too far, we scale back. But I think as an American people, we're always looking to refine the system that we have because we understand that it's not perfect. And contentious. Yes. I always, I always smile and, and have my silent superior laugh when people talk about, uh, you know, how divisive, how, you know, how government, eh, and I'm like, have you not studied anything about this country? I mean, even, even the Constitutional Convention was a very uh, angry mob, for lack of a better term. No, I remember uh, teaching my first college class in the fall of 2004, and we were just about, you know, we were within, within a month or two, this is late August, of another presidential election. And I remember the media at that time, I was probably on the way to class that morning and agitated. The media at that time, as they often say, they said, you know, we're, we're divided more today, and today, of course, is 2004, than perhaps at any other time in our nation's history. And so I threw that idea out to my class that day. You know, they're mainly 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. And I said, what do you think about that? Are we really more divided today than ever before? And they were a little shy, but then a few hands went up. And the first one said, what about the 1860s? Uh, and then other, mm-hmm. what about the 1960s? You know, it was always Ray Price, Nixon's longtime speechwriter, who always liked to compare those two. If the 1860s was an actual civil war, the 1960s was a proxy civil war. And in our news feeds, whether you're on the right or whether you know you're on the left, I don't think it makes any difference. Uh, you know, th- this is a narrative that keeps coming back over and over. And the reason it's successful to the extent that it is is because Americans don't know their history well enough. Lincoln had to had to go into Washington D.C. at night. You know, I mean, I mean, he had to he had to sneak into the White House if we want to talk about contentiousness. Uh, I uh, to get back what we're doing because I can go down these things. And matter of fact, I will just take one little side trip. As a professor of history, now, do you have to? And is there is there a problem with students? You know, when I went to college, I came in to be told what I didn't know. Honestly, do you find now, especially in the realm of historical studies? that you have more students coming in with, and I know this is a buzzword, an agenda, a preconceived notion where they want to prove what they think they know. Or am I wrong? You you know, you have that. I would say, um, you know, this is not based on any kind of data or fact, but I would say, you know, on each side of the political aisle, you have about 20% that are activists that you got to watch out for. And so you do get a student either on the right or the left occasionally who's there to make a point. Uh, but I would say that, you know, that, that is a concern. Every time I go, you have to kind of read the classroom and figure that out. The bigger concern, I would say now, is that students are afraid to actually say what they think in classrooms. Wow. And not because of me. They're not worried about being judged by me. They're worried about being yeah. judged by their peers. Because we all have recording devices in our pockets that spy on us every day. And they're, and a lot, they'll tell me after class, you know, I, look, I teach political history. We get into race. We get into gender. You know, we get into all the dangerous stuff. And, uh, you know, there are multiple times each semester that I think is today the day I'm going to say something that's honest or truthful that goes viral. Uh, and you have to watch yourself. And students will tell me after class that, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not comfortable saying what I really think. And the college classroom has gone from a place where anything goes, where free speech reigns supreme, to a place that takes some work to get to free speech. And sometimes, even at the end of a 16-week class, you never get there. Students are still too shy. And that's too bad, because I feel like no matter where you're at on the political spectrum, college should really be a free-for-all of ideas. You should be going down the intellectual rabbit hole and learning about yourself and and situating yourself in the world that you live in. And I think too often today, because of fear on both sides of the political aisle, that doesn't happen as as, as it should. Yeah, I, uh, I had a guest on the program who's a law professor at Stanford. And it was amazing. He said a lot of what you just said, right? That that when you're just talking judicial facts, you know, you'll have you'll have kids who say, well, that was wrong. And his point is, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact of what it is and how it was reached and the decision and the thought process that went, well, it doesn't matter. It was wrong. And 
we're all guilty of that. We're, we're all guilty of, of going, you know, especially as you said, rewriting history, going back and going, well, they should have done this or they shouldn't have done that. And so I, I can only imagine those of you who are truly in the higher education sphere of the tightrope, you must feel you need to walk every day. Well, and even in my writing, like in a book like this, I, I really try to be transparent with my reader. I mean, I, I really try to separate facts. Now, people can disagree on what the facts are sometimes, but I try to separate between, you know, things that are on the continuum closer to a fact and things that are closer on the continuum to an opinion, you know, or an observation. And I try to be clear to my reader where, you know, th this happened or here's where the evidence is a little spotty and we have to make an educated guess. And over here, I'm just going to tell you what I really think. And whether it's in the classroom or whether it's in a book, you know, oftentimes by the end of a semester, the students will say, you know, one of those very last class sessions, I usually teach on Tuesday and Thursday mornings, and they'll say, can we just spend one class so you can tell us what you really think? Because we can't figure out where you are politically. And I feel like that is the, one of the highest compliments that you can pay me mm -hmm. as a writer, as a researcher. And as a teacher, you know, to because because really what I really think might not be material, you know, to what the facts are. And so there's nothing more important than simply having a good fact pattern and having good history. My opinion might be important, but take the presidential tapes. What I have to say is far less important than what's actually on the tape, what the president's actually saying. Good point. Well, let's get back into the year that broke politics. So LBG, LBJ decides not to run. Now, we forget, you know, he finished Kennedy's term. Then he won election as on his own right. And then he could have run again. But he decided not to. And I find it fascinating what you wrote about, and especially including uh, Lady Bird Johnson and her sayings of why the decision was reached. Can we can we go into that? Yeah, so um, almost all book on uh, any any book on on 1968 effectively treats Lyndon Johnson as a lame duck. Uh, as of March 31st, he goes on television to give a Vietnam speech, uh, responding to the Tet Offensive, and at the very end, it has a surprise announcement that he's not going to run for re-election, even though he could have, uh, and he's not going to accept the nomination of his party. And and what you know, it's hard writing about someone in the case of Lyndon Johnson, who, as far as we know, was not a writer himself. You know, as far as we know, he he didn't he didn't have a diary. He didn't write long, substantive letters. He didn't communicate what he really thought in writing a lot of times. But Lady Bird did. She was really ahead of her time, and she was dictating her diary all the while. You know, in his presidency. And oftentimes she says she uses the royal we. I mean, she's speaking for both of them. Or sometimes even you can hear he'll interrupt her while she's dictating. He'll come in and talk or she'll comment on today on the Hill. Senator Fulbright said this or that. Well, obviously she's sharing a concern, you know, that her husband has. And what I take away from this source, she's the closest person to him to keep a daily record as far as we know. Although, you know, I'm always surprised by new records that are being opened all the time. She keeps a record, and what it documents is that his health was a much bigger factor than we realized at the time. He, Johnson turned 60 in 1968. That was somewhat old back then. His own father had died at age 60. And I think when you, when you, you know, you, you reach an age, you're aware of that. You're aware of, you know, this is the year my father died. Now I'm older than he is. I mean, there's an awareness. And Johnson always said, Johnson men die young. And I think secondly, from the diary, uh, Johnson had a fear, as Lady Bird put it in her diary, that he would not be able to unite the country when he ran for re-election. Now he still controlled, I think, the delegates and he controlled the, the state and county chairman. I think he probably could have been nominated if he wanted to in Chicago in 1968. I don't know how the general election would have gone, but I think it was an open enough question for Johnson in 68, as it was for Harry Truman in 1952, and as it might be for Joe Biden Jr. in 2024, that he had enough doubt that he wasn't going to risk it, is kind of where I come down. He uh, he toyed with it, though. He toyed with it after even after giving the speech. He you know, he yeah, he loved the adulation. 
he 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 again this is my my supposition from reading what you wrote uh that he that he enjoyed it he wanted people to want him to run well and there certainly that, was a draft johnson movement that popped up throughout that year john connolly outgoing texas governor was involved in that uh marvin watson kind of johnson's appointment secretary who's postmaster general was part of that uh chicago mayor uh, richard daly was part of the draft johnson movement the question of course is not whether there was this chance to come in, in back into the race. The question is, how much was Johnson aware of this movement? And what did he think about it? You know, and that's the part that, that we don't really know. I think Johnson was reacting. We talked earlier about Americans reacting to events as they unfolded that year. So was Johnson. I think initially after March 31st, you know, Johnson's written off as a lame duck at that point. All the attention turns to all the challengers. I think Johnson, I tell a different story in the book. I think Johnson remained as relevant as ever in politics, but he simply shifted his political energy from being on the ballot to influencing the choice of his successor. And I think he initially wanted liberal uh, Republican Governor Nelson Rockefeller to be his successor, finding him to be the most compatible in terms of policy. But then the story that I tell is that he Nick LBJ gradually shifts to my surprise, you know, into the Nixon column for a number of reasons. So I think there's nothing static about LBJ during that year, as like much of the year itself. Stunning to think that the president was more interested in having his Republican challenger win than he was his own vice president. I, I do want to get this, this little thing. I told you, the time is just zip by. So I'm trying to get all of this in. <laughs> but the activism at the Democratic Convention, and I thought one of the quotes when you were talking about some of the people, you know, the Abby Hoffmans and, and that entire group, was they didn't care what the issue was. They just wanted to be disruptive. They just wanted to be a pain in the butt, right? And it didn't matter. This was the one that they had a chance to be at. Because the Republican convention was a lot more controlled, if you will, and and they and they had a chance to go in and just do truly horrible things. And we sit back and we see the the police launch in and do all this stuff. And what's not reported is what they had done to cause a lot of those reactions. Yeah, you know, and and I grew up kind of reading about this period. Um, you know, there's a whole literature on, on the call it the anti-war movement, call it the counterculture. And, um, you know, I grew up reading authors like David Farber of, of Kansas, of uh, Mel Small, of Wayne State, who wrote about a lot of this activism, uh, and, and I, realizing that I had at most a chapter you know, to talk about this. And, and so, you know, what, what I tried to do, and, and be careful, because I didn't want the anti-war movement to come across as some monolith. These were all long-haired, smelly, you know, young uh, middle to upper class white guys. I mean, th that that's a part of it. But I try to show that that they were also nuanced. You know, there were you know th there there's different kinds of countercultural movements that are all folded in, into one here. You know, and, and it's hard because the Abby Hoffmans and the Jerry Rubens. You know, their quotes are so colorful that that every author you know you just can't miss quoting them because of. Uh, the, the the own sort of self descriptions of their outrageous behavior you just can't miss, but I think there were some who really wanted to be disruptive. There were some who were really passionately against the war and the draft, um, and so I think they really did. But I think the stars of that movement, like some of the names we've talked about, really are the ones that we remember because they went on to write books and have careers of activism, uh, and so those are also some of the stars that I feature in this chapter. But I tried to be thoughtful. The problem is, you know, not everybody wrote a best-selling book. Well, there's so many interesting characters in this. And, you know, I, I'm going to have to have you back on because we're never going to finish in an hour all the things I want to talk to you about. Uh, but uh, Richard Nixon, um, fascinating character. Uh, you know, again, the only president to resign and, and, and we go from there, but it doesn't get, does not get the credit due to how good of a politician he was. Well, I think this he, is one of the reasons why Johnson and Nixon sort of come to respect each other, that while they're different, these were politicians. These were people who spent a career 
building and defending institutions and politics. They didn't tear them down at a time when, at a time in the late 1960s, a bit again like our time today, when so many millions of Americans have lost their faith in American institutions, whether that be government, whether that be uh, national media, whether that be universities we talked about, how about political parties? How about organized religion with the emphasis on organized? Um, Nixon and Johnson defended institutions and believe they, they protected our democratic institutions. And so I think that's part of why they came to respect each other is because they were clearly masters of the trade in, in, you know, each in their own way on different sides of the aisle. And Johnson, ultimately, a lot of the Johnson people told me that Johnson believed to be, to be president, you had to have a killer instinct. And, you know, I, there's different ways to look at that. I mean, the president is commander in chief and might need to make life or death decisions at a moment's notice. And Johnson came to believe that Humphrey, Humphrey did not have the killer instinct needed to be president. But Richard Nixon, while, while opposed to Johnson for so much of his own career, he did. And he was presidential, was presidential timber, more or less. And so I think that's one of the reasons why Johnson came to believe Nixon might be a better successor for Johnson's own legacy. One of the fascinating things I, I saw in the book, and I thought this was brilliant, is you were the first person to really, I don't know if you're the first person to get access to them, but the, the first person who showed the behind the scenes of the Reverend Billy Graham. And we have lost who Billy Graham is, how important he was to American culture and society, much less politics. Uh, and we see a lot of the back and forth and some of the things, you know, he was he was a go between between Johnson and Nixon, wasn't he? Well, he was, you know, there's a whole chapter in the book that's called Messenger, because I think that accurately describes Graham's role in 1968. Um, you know, one of the things I do as a historian is is if you if you're going to write about history, you better make friends with archivists. And so, you know, frequently I talk to archivists all over the country and I say things like, well, what new records have you gotten in? You know, it could have been from some new estate. Uh, what are you working on? You know, what's going to be open soon? Because, you know, this is 55 years ago to everybody else. But to me, it's brand new, you know, if you're writing a book. And so there was an archivist at Wheaton College during the course of this research, who told me uh, that we're, we're going to open, we're going to have a limited opening uh, of Billy Graham's diaries, or as he called it, his VIP notebooks. And so I went out there, you know, suburb of Chicago, and I realized that because Graham lived to be 99 when he died in February of 2018, this is 50 some volumes of, I would call it contact, sometimes verbatim contact with presidents beginning with Harry Truman in 1950 and going all the way to Barack Obama in 2014, documenting contact with those presidents, their families, and top staff, as well as there's other volumes of the diary that contain contact with over 50 foreign heads of state. And I asked the archivist the question that you set up there, who else has seen this? Am I the first one? And when I asked that question, I said, oh, we can't remember exactly who's seen it. You have to be in that room to look at it, at this archive at Wheaton College. And I was told there was one other researcher who looked at it for the British royal family, but they thought I was the first person to look at it for the presidency. And in 1968, Graham uh, had, was passing messages between Johnson and, and Nixon. Also, he knew Wallace, he knew Humphrey, he knew, he knew California Governor Ronald Reagan, he knew former President Dwight Eisenhower. I think I calculated he knew each one of these people almost 20 years at that point, as you know, he was reaching the peak of his profession as they were theirs. And the peak of this message passing activity between Johnson and Nixon comes just after Labor Day in 68, the traditional kickoff of the high season of the campaign, where, where Nixon, Graham takes a, a message from Nixon into Johnson's Oval Office and carries a Nixon six-point pledge to Johnson that as president, he would never criticize him by name. He would give him credit for Vietnam when it's all over. He would consult with him regularly in retirement. Uh, and he would try to give, he's a hard, he said he was the hardest working president in 140 years, which was a direct comparison to one of Johnson's political heroes, and Andrew Jackson, in the 1820s, and that Nixon would do everything he could to give Johnson a good place in history. And that is just an incredible thing that I, I can't tell you there's a, another really direct parallel 
in modern U.S. history, Nixon at that point has given Johnson all the ammunition to blow up his campaign, just as it's going into high gear in 68. And of course, Johnson doesn't do that. And this remains secret for 50 years. So it's one of these incredible things uh, that's in the book. And is this, as far as what you've seen, was this the only time where Graham admitted to who he was supporting privately? My, my take is that, that Graham supported LBJ in 68. Uh, he was the closest to LBJ personally and politically. So he was a moderate Democrat, pro-civil rights, call it, you know, from the fringe of the South. A true Southerner didn't view Johnson to be Southern because Southern, he's from kind of Southwest Texas. He was really Southwestern. Uh, that was, when he was born in Gillespie County in 1908, that was about as far southwest as you could go in the United States. New Mexico and Arizona weren't states yet. California has a whole different history, as you know, between South and North. Uh, and, and like Graham, Graham's from Charlotte, North Carolina, grew up on a dairy farm, kind of on the fringe of the South. Graham always, beginning with the Chattanooga rally in 1953 in a segregated venue, he refused to allow his audience, his choir, anything else to be segregated. He ignored the rules and he got in trouble for it at times. So Graham writes in his diary that if Johnson had run and not withdrawn in 1968, as we know he did, he said it would have presented an enormous test of loyalties to him. Because while he loved Johnson as a friend and a person, he really felt Nixon deserved another shot at the presidency. After losing narrowly to Kennedy and Johnson in 60, more decisively in 62 for the California governorship, and it would have been tough on Graham. When Johnson withdraws, Graham says, I went all out for Nixon, and one of my goals was to bring Johnson and Nixon together to re for them to realize they really needed each other for their own legacies. I, I, I don't mean to give this man short shrift, and like I said, I, I, I simply have to have you back on when you have time. I'm from Alabama. I grew up in Alabama. I went to, my, my, I, I, I spent two years at Lurleen B. Wallace Junior College, right? And George Wallace is a real person to me. Uh, and we've lost him the history and all he comes across is a racist. And let's be clear, he had racist policies to begin with. But as you said, that was part of his political game at the time, that he wasn't necessarily racist on an individual basis within himself, but he played to the politics that, that was going to get him elected. Well, I would say I, I treat Wallace in the book just like everybody else. He's not static. He evolves. Uh, you know, I was in Montgomery just last week, and I gave two talks, two book talks down there. To, uh, to There's still a few Wallace faithful who are still around even these days. And I think Wallace is an evolution. He loses the governorship in 52 because he's too moderate on race. You know, it's his rival, Patterson, you know, who was far more extreme on race, who was endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan. And so Wallace decides, well, if I'm going to win statewide in Alabama, I got to shift right. And he, he says some things about race in 62 and 63 that I think showed how maybe how naive he was, that he could get away with that, and uh, that he regretted, that he repented for, uh, for the, really the, the rest of his career. Mm -hmm. 64, he had his first taste of national politics, entering three primaries in places like Maryland, and in Wisconsin, and realizes he needs to have a message that's not only popular outside of Alabama, but outside of the South. And be, he begins to shift to what I describe as sort of a, a more Southern populist. I, I say in the book, a, 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 demo, a demagogue first, a segregation is second. His priorities shift. And by 68, he really has his first full bore attempt at the presidency, runs a 50-state campaign, gets on the ballot as a, as a third party. And all the 50 of those states, except the District of Columbia, and runs really an anti-elite, anti-establishment campaign. Uh, and that's really started a movement that's been with us ever since. Uh, and, and he ran, he was more of a Southern Democrat, as you know. But now, especially on the Republican side, due to Trump, uh, that, that kind of movement, anti-elite, anti-establishment, is very much with us today. And he picked the world's worst vice presidential nominee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Curtis, as I say in the book, Curtis LeMay, he, he was a, he was an honorable person, you know. Yeah, so you saying as a vice president nominee, he probably had no business entering politics, uh, but he felt it was a duty. He felt he was from a generation that it, that if you were asked to be appointed to something or to take on a political role, unless you had a darn good reason to say no thanks, 
there was no such thing as saying no thanks. If you were asked, it was a duty to always a duty to serve. And so in effect, he put on that uniform one last time, probably one time too many in his career. Uh, and uh, he said, yes, sir. And he joined that ticket. And I think Wallace knew from its debut in Pittsburgh that it was a mistake. And he sent him on a fact-finding mission to Vietnam, most of the remainder of the campaign, where he couldn't, <laughs> where he couldn't get into much trouble. It's just a fascinating read. And I, I tell you, as far as his, his, historical, not novels, but just a, 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 a slice of, of history, I found it fascinating. It uh, it was one of those things that I just was, you know, anytime I had an extra spare minute, I was always reading it and enjoying it. And there's so much more on what, because we do need to talk about Wallace, you know, when we have time and go back into it and and everything he did and what a masterful politician he was too. You had possibly the three best politicians of that era. And I, when I say that era, I think from the 1950s through 1990. Uh, I, I can't think of three better politicians. I don't care about their politics, but it's the, the political nature of them and what they did. As you said, Wallace got on in 50 states. That is impossible. And when you talk, when you think about what it takes to get on the ballot here in California, I mean, they do everything they can to make sure that's impossible. Well, what you're saying so, right there really sings to my soul because, you know, I, I come at this not with preconceived ideas or a political agenda. My goal is to drive the creation of new knowledge. And I am basically an archive rat. I mean, you spend enough time in archives. I travel and spend time over 100 nights a year in archives now for 10 years. And my job is to put more interesting stuff on the public record. And that's basically the book that you have there. My next one's on LBJ White House years. So I'm expanding this out on an even bigger canvas. Uh, and, and look, I'm lucky to wake up and just learn new things and share with other people. And that's what I'm trying to do. Told you I'd nerd out. Told you I'd completely nerd and geek out. This is the kind of stuff, you know, it's a good thing you don't live close. <laughs> well, I'm down in Orange County about half the year when I teach at Chapman. So I, I guess I am close enough. <laughs> Well, next time you make it to Silicon Valley and you have an extra nine, ten hours. <laughs> uh, I'd be glad to. I, and, and they go I, would, yep. I would love to have you here and find a glass of something and and get into the meat and of everything because there is there is so much. That's why I love history, because you never know it all. It's the old, you know, it's the old joke about historians. You know, one asks the other, what do you think of the French Revolution? The other one goes, mm, too soon. No, I, I, can say, <laughs> I can say to you genuinely and, and honestly, the more that I learn about history, the more I realize I have, I have to learn about history. Luke A. Nictor, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. And I hope you'll come back on again, because I've got more things to talk about. Uh, I would love to, anytime.